Hello everybody, you are very welcome to this evening's meeting on the Waterford City and County Development Plan. My name is Vanessa Liston and I will be facilitating this evening's session. This meeting is the first of three that will be held over the coming days. Tonight's meeting focuses on environment and heritage, tomorrow on local placemaking, and finally Thursday on economy, agriculture and education. And all of these meetings will be starting at 7 p.m. and finishing at quarter past eight. Our agenda this evening includes three presentations on the topic uh, related to environment and heritage. We're going to hear first from Raymond Maloney on environmental issues for consideration in the drafting of the development plan. We will then hear from Bernie Guest on um, natural heritage. And finally, we'll hear from Rose Ryle on built heritage in Waterford. We will start the meeting with an overview from Liam McGree, senior planner, on this initial public consultation um, period, content of the development plan and the strategic issues involved. Before we start, I would just like to highlight the Q&A panel that you see on your right. This is where you can pose your questions for the speakers during the course of the session. The speakers, once they're finished their presentations, will be able to see and respond to your questions. At the Q&A session at the end, this is where um, the speakers will pull out those questions that have been asked um, and also address any further questions that have, you have not yet received um, a response to. For any questions that we don't reach uh, within this session, all questions and answers will be published on the Development Plan website at consult.waterfordcouncil.ie over the next coming days. So without further ado, I will hand you over to our first speaker, Liam McGree. And Liam McGree is the Waterford City and County Council's senior planner. And his presentation tonight will give an overview of this initial public consultation and the strategic issues. Liam, you're very welcome. OK, thank you very much, Vanessa. Um, as Vanessa said, uh, I'm senior planner with uh, Waterford City and County Council. And I'm just going to give you a very brief overview of you know, what is a development plan, how a development plan is made, the various steps in the process and how you can get involved in that process and how you can input into it uh, at the various stages throughout. So initially, I suppose the question for many people is what is a development plan? Uh, well, the elected members of each planning authority are required to make a development plan every six years. And the development plan sets out a framework for the development of the whole of the local authorities area. Uh, it's important to note that it's the elected members that make the development plan. We've uh, divided our functions into what are called executive functions and reserved functions. Uh, the reserve functions are those that are performed by the elected members. So the adoption of a development plan is one of the most important reserve functions. So it is the, the members that you have elected that will make that plan on your behalf. Uh, the plan will consist of a written statement and a series of maps which will illustrate the spatial application of those policies and those maps are typically land use zoning maps, roads objectives, conservation objectives. Um, and then all development, whether it be residential, industrial, commercial, amenity, public or private, uh, will have to generally take place in accordance with the development plan. Applications for planning, for planning permission are judged against the development plan to see to what extent they comply with the objectives of the plan, as well as the local authority's own work programme. Um, applications for funding from central government are tested against the development plan to see whether or not they comply with the objectives in the plan. So, as I said, throughout, whether it's our development, uh, whether it's local authority development, whether it's national development, whether it's private development, it all has to be tested against the development plan. This is the blueprint for the next six years and beyond. Um, the maps that I mentioned earlier, there's a typical example of a zoning map. Uh, that's a zoning map um, which outlines the various land use policies in and around uh, the city of Watford. Uh, different colours indicating different land use zones. So you've got residential zones, commercial, industrial zones and some of the major roads objectives shown there. So, you know, it, it will be presented in a way that will enable people to look at the maps, identify their own properties and have some indication as to what they might expect over the next six years and beyond in their neighbourhood. So the development plan, what should it be? Well, it should provide an overarching strategy vision for the development of the city and the county. Uh, it should set out integrated policies and objectives to realise that strategic vision. Now, 
there is a lot of legislation around this. I'm not going to go into it, but uh, there are sections in the Planning and Development Act 2000, which have been amended numerous times since its adoption in the year 2000, which set out specifically what a development plan has to contain. So there are minimum requirements. And then beyond that, you know, we, we try and develop and deliver a development plan that's tailored for the particular area and has regard to particular issues uh, that have been highlighted through the consultation process. Um, the development plan must be consistent with national and regional important, um, you know, it, it's part of a hierarchy of plans and uh, each local authority is tasked with, tasked with delivering uh, regional and national policy in their local areas. Uh, the plan must be evidence based and objectively anticipate the future needs of all groups within society. So it's very important that, you know, we look and see where we're at and where the issues lie and I suppose that's the exercise that we're involved in at the moment. Uh, we've pulled together um, quite a lot of statistical information to date but we now have to go and we have to talk to the stakeholders and the public to see you know what are the issues uh, that we need to deal with so that you know it, it's a fair reflection of um, the views and the wishes of the people who ultimately will be impacted and will to deliver on the objectives of the development plan, whether they be, as I say, individuals, agencies, uh, government agencies, private bodies. Uh, the development plan should be a catalyst for positive change and progress, and it should in every instance ensure the protection of the environment and heritage. And I suppose that's the major theme of tonight's discussion, um, environment and heritage and how those objectives and how those initiatives are delivered through the development plan process. As I say, ownership of the development plan by the elected members who adopt it and by the wider public and sectoral interests will be critical to its realisation and effective implementation. Again, you know, th these plans have to be implemented. They have to be realistic. Uh, it's not a plan that will be adopted and will sit on a shelf for the next six years. It will be referenced multiple times every day of the week. As I say, whether you're assessing a planning application, whether you're making a grant application, whether the local authority is prioritising works within its own area. So there, the, there are documents that we engage with every day of the week. So it's important that everybody's on board and that everybody, you know, has a shared vision as to where we're going. And in making and adopting the development plan, the planning authority uh, act in the interests of the common good and the proper planning and sustainable development of the area. And the members and the executive must operate in a transparent manner and must follow due process and must make decisions based on relevant and clearly articulated considerations. You know, there's a process uh, and the process is followed very closely and that's to ensure that um, you know, it, it is a transparent uh, exercise and that everybody knows exactly why decisions have been made and what, what to expect from the process. It's, it's, it's evidence based. We look at the Central Statistics Office. Uh, we look at uh, information from the census in terms of population, demographics, educational attainment, employment, unemployment, households, travel to work patterns. All of that information is gathered. It's mapped and it's available to us and uh, it will help inform uh, the process throughout. Layout and content, as I say, it's a written statement and a series of maps. The written statement must include a core strategy that demonstrates the development objectives in the plan are consistent as far as practicable with national and regional development objectives. So that's important. That has to be in every development plan of every local authority. A clear statement at the start as to where it fits within the overall hierarchy. And it must also include a separate statement that shows that development objectives in the plan are consistent with conservation and protection of the environment. And the Act, as I said earlier, sets out a number of mandatory development objectives. There's a list of them there. So they're natu natural amenities, natural heritage, zoning of land, climate change, gale talked areas, landscape character, you know, the, the, the list is there in front of you. Um, th those are the minimum requirements. Uh, we'll go well beyond that in terms of the issues that we will address, but um, we're obliged to, to make sure that each one of those topics are covered in detail. The background and as I said, there's a hierarchy of plans and it's important to see this, um, see the new development plan within that context. Um, since the amalgamation of Waterford City and County Council and the abolition of Dunmore or Dungarvan um, Town Council, um, we're now operating as a unitary planning authority and Waterford City and County Council was established on the 1st of June 2014. 
Um, when the City and County Council was established, there were three plans in existence at that time. There was the Waterford County Development Plan, which had been adopted in 2011, the Dungarvan Town Development Plan adopted a year later in 2012, and the City Development Plan, which was adopted in 2013. Now, all three of those plans remain in effect as of now. Um, they would normally have a life cycle. You can see on the cover, said the Dungarvan is 2012 to 2018. Obviously, we're now in 2020. Um, but we were instructed by government not to make a new development plan for the city and county until such time as a regional strategy was in place. So again, national policy at the top feeds into regional policy, regional policy then informs local policy. So uh, the national and the regional policies have been adopted. So now we are combining those three plans into one and obviously updating, revising and amending where necessary. The Below the county plan, we've got a number of local area plans, and this is, I suppose, where um, the, the broad policy is uh, applied uh, at a local level. And this is what would, I suppose, um, interest quite a lot of members of the public. You know, what's happening in my area? What's happening in Tremor, Lismore, Port Law in our case? And it, it, the local area plans are generally for the larger towns uh, within the county. Uh, we've only got three local area plans uh, as things currently stand and uh, a, a decision will have to be made by the members as we move forward whether or not we would extend that list of local area plans. But certainly we will be reviewing all three of those local area plans and we will have three new plans for those three uh, settlements. The national and regional context, um, as I said, there is a national uh, planning framework which was adopted on the 29th of May 2018. That's Project Ireland 2040, and that's an overarching planning policy for the state as a whole. Um, within the state, then there are three um, regions. Uh, we in Waterford are within the southern region. And the Southern Regional Assembly adopted earlier on this year a regional spatial and economic strategy, which gives effect to the national policy at a regional level. So that's what we've been waiting for. That was adopted in January. Uh, we were about to commence our process then in March of this year, um, but COVID came along and that has, uh, I suppose, upset and delayed everything. So we're only just getting getting on with it now. We had anticipated being a little bit further along, but um, we're fine. We're, we're operating within our statutory time limits. So, you know, we'll, uh, we'll make up the time as we go. Uh, we've also got to have regard to um, what are called Section 28 guidelines. Uh, the government and the minister will make guidelines from time to time. Uh, these are mandatory on all planning authorities. There's a list there and those will deal with things like, say, renewable energy, rural housing, um, design manuals for urban roads and streets, uh, flooding, flood risk management. Those are all uh, mandatory, so every local authority will have to have regard to those in drafting up their development plans. So the stages in making the development plan, and we can get into this, you know, in Q&A later on. Uh, this is just, again, a broad overview. Uh, there are a number of stages. We've cleared the first stage, which is the preliminary stage, which is uh, information gathering, baseline report, cross-sectoral engagement. Um, and then we move on to pre uh, prepare a, an issues paper and present that to the public, uh, which is stage two, pre-draft. So we've prepared the issues paper, we've published it. Um, we're in a period of public consultation now at the moment. Uh, that public consultation uh, has to last for at least eight weeks. Once the consultation is over, um, the chief executive will prepare a report. That report will then go to the members, setting out the various issues that uh, have been highlighted how um, the chief executive and the executive within the local authority would recommend to the members that we proceed. Um, so th that's the next step. The members will then give a direction to ourselves as to what they want in the plan and we go away, we prepare the draft on their behalf. We bring the draft back to them. If they're satisfied with the draft, they adopt a draft plan, which then goes on public display again. So this is only the first of three rounds of public consultation. And uh, we're talking at the moment about what might be in the plan. The next round will be a draft plan that you can engage with. You know, you can you know go through it line by line and you can raise issues in relation to it. And once that second round of public consultation is completed, we go then and we prepare what are called material amendments. Uh, so those changes are introduced um, again by the members. They have to be adopted by the members. 
um, they go on public display for the last time. That's the third and final public consultation. Um, again, after every public consultation, the chief executive's report is prepared on the consultation. It lists the people who made submissions. It lists the issues that were raised and it comments on each of the issues that were raised and makes a recommendation as to what action should be taken. And once they've, the members have considered the final chief executive's report and once they've considered all the material amendments, the plan is then made. So the process, as you see in the boxes on the left hand side, it's a long process. It's almost two years from start to finish. Uh, we've started now. We'll have a draft um, early uh, next summer, early to mid next summer, probably June of next year. We'll have a draft plan and um, then there would be a public consultation again immediately following that. So the initial public consultation, as I said, this is where we're at at the moment. The strategic issues paper is available. It's been published on our website. We've published notices in the newspapers. Uh, they're available in our public libraries, in our public offices. Um, we invite all of you to make submissions. Um, there's a portal which has been developed. It's consult.waterfordcouncil.ie. If you go onto that portal, you'll find a copy of the issues paper. You'll also um, be prompted to register and to make a submission. Uh, the issues paper is set out. Um, you'll see the, the, the table of contents reproduced on the right hand side of the slide there under various headings. Um, but I suppose at this stage we're not we're not giving you the answers. We're just prompting you with questions. We're saying these are the issues and uh, these are the statistics. You know, this is where we're at at the moment and we want you to tell us uh, which direction you think the council should go in. And then that report goes back to the members and the members will then proceed to adopt the draft based on that input from yourselves and from other agencies. Um, just some screenshots there of the um, the the website and the consultation portal. Uh, you'll see the one up on the top left left hand side when you log in, you'll be prompted to register. Um, you'll see there register a new user. Uh, once you've registered, you can then make a submission. Um, the second screen, um, the one that's underlying uh, the, the, the one in the top right. So this is the screen in the bottom, uh, or, or, sorry, the screen in the bottom right. Uh, there's a number of video clips in there. Um, they'll take you again through the process. Uh, there's some frequently asked questions. Uh, you'll be able to see submissions that others have made. Again, any submissions that you make will be available for others to view as well. So uh, it's just important to bear that in mind. You know, this is a public process. So any submissions, any um, suggestions that you make to the local authority will be made available publicly and will be uh, the subject of um, a report from the chief executive to the members. Um, so that's it. Um, as I said, the uh, the website and the uh, the portal is available at consult.waterfordcouncil.ie. We'd ask all of you to um, to engage in the process. Um, we welcome all. Um, we've got a small team within the planning department. Department. We will only do this of public and other agencies and other departments within the local authority. So I just ask you to to engage as best you can. And um, this is the first of three opportunities, and we hope to be back talking to you again uh, at each step as we move along through the process. So thanks very much. That's great, Liam. That's great, Liam. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. If you have any questions at all for Liam, if you could put those into the Q&A and just address them to Liam and he'll be able to pick those up uh, throughout the course of the rest of the meeting. Now, our next speaker this evening um, is Ray Maloney and Ray is Senior Executive Officer in the Environment Department in the Council and since 2014. And the Environment Department has responsibility for a wide range of activities and these include waste management, environmental enforcement, environmental awareness, the management of bring centres and the presentation of major urban centres of Waterford, Tremor and Dungarvan, including parks and open spaces and climate action. So Raymond's presentation this evening will focus on the key environmental issues for consideration in drafting the Waterford Development Plan. So Ray, you're very welcome. Over to you. Thank you very much, Vanessa. As Vanessa has said, my presentation tonight will focus on some of the key environmental issues for consideration in drafting the Waterford Development Plan 2022 to 2028. 
this is in no means a comprehensive um, list of environmental issues, but it's the ones that we see are important at this point in time. In my presentation, I will look at the current position in environmental legislation. Um, the main part of my presentation will deal with climate action and energy, including adaptation and mitigation. And finally, I will have three slides on waste management, water framework directive and open spaces with one slide on each. So at the moment, Liam has gone through um, the previous development plans. We had the Waterford County Development Plan in 2011, the Town, Dungarvan Town Council in 2012, and also the Waterford City Development Plan in 2013. And by the time the new Waterford Development Plan is adopted, it will be more than 10 years since the last development plans were reviewed. And it's fair to say that a lot has changed in the intervening period. I don't think I'd be very, it's been critical of the previous plans, but I would think that climate change policy was not very prominent in those plans. Certainly it was mentioned in them and with reference to policies to support the implementation of climate change strategies, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, maximizing energy efficiency in buildings, etc. And certainly the city plan was stronger on climate change considerations than the county council and the Dungarvan town plans. <clears throat> However, all plans were reflective of national policy at that time, which, if we're being honest, was quite weak. However, in the intervening period, we have seen the impact of extreme weather events. We've had Storm Ophelia, Storm Emma, and we've had the drought conditions in the summer of 2018. And I suppose there's been a sudden realisation that climate change is happening now. And we've seen greater environmental awareness and protests calling for global action on climate change. And for those who have been activists, I suppose, um, in climate change, now is the opportunity to influence local policy on climate change. And by submitting your um, comments and your observations in relation to the draft development plan. As I said, since 2011, when the county plan was adopted, there's been a lot of change nationally in terms of policy. We've had the Low Carbon, climate, Low Carbon and Climate Action Act of 2015, and that led to the formulation of the National Mitigation Plan, the National Adaptation Framework. And from that, we had the Waterford City and County Council Climate Adaptation Strategy. In addition, late last year, we had the Climate Action Plan 2019, and that includes 183 individual actions across all sectors. And I should have said that the Waterford City and County Council Climate Adaptation Strategy is available on the Council's website. More recently, we've had the EU Green Deal, and indeed, there's more to come. The new government have said that they will publish the new Climate Action Amendment Bill 2020 within the first 100 days of government. And today is day 53 of that government. <clears throat> In relation to climate action, as I said, we'll deal with adaptation and mitigation. Adaptation refers to the process of adjustment to the actual or expected effect of climate. Oh, sorry, uh, to the actual or expected climate and its effects. So we can see a very good example of climate adaptation is the picture on the bottom right hand corner there, which is taken from the glass wall as part of the storm or the flood alleviation works in Waterford City. And without that wall, the premises, the businesses and the homes across the street would have been inundated with water. Mitigation refers to actions that we can take to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases that are having an adverse effect on climate change. The climate adaptation strategy as adopted by Walford City and County Council, as I said, is part of the National Adaptation Framework. And all public bodies were required to adopt a climate adaptation plan by September of last year. The purpose of the plan is to ensure a comprehension of the key risks from climate and the vulnerabilities that face us here in Walford is to bring forward the implementation of a climate resilient adaptation actions in a planned and proactive manner and ensure that climate adaptation considerations are mainstreamed into all operations and functions of the local authority. And as I said, the Walford City and County Council climate adaptation strategy was adopted in September 2019 by the elected members of the council and it's available on the County Council's website. That climate adaptation strategy contains eight goals 25 objectives and 75 actions. And amongst those goals, we would have business and continuity, infrastructure and the built environment, land use and development policy, water services, natural resources and cultural infrastructure, 
community health and well-being, biodiversity and coastal erosion. Waterford being a coastal county, coastal erosion is in our plan, which wouldn't appear obviously in a lot of inland county plans. With the objectives, sorry, if we look at goal three, which is land use planning, and specifically the objectives under that goal is to consider and integrate climate change adaptation actions into land use planning to implement climate change adaptation policies to help to transition to a climate resilient, low carbon society. And that's a term that appears numerous times throughout the Climate Action Act that we will develop a climate resilient, low carbon society in Ireland by 2050. And the other objective within land use planning is to support sustainable future development planning for coastal communities. Specifically, again, some of the actions under the land use planning is to integrate climate change adaptation as a guiding principle and strategic objective within the development plan to reduce the vulnerability of County Warford to the impacts of climate change. So it's rather timely that we adopted the climate adaptation strategy late last year, and now we've commenced the review of the county or the city and county development plan, which allows us the opportunity to integrate the climate adaptation strategy into the development plan. Another action is to promote the integrated planning design and delivery of green infrastructure through planning policies, development standards and conditions on planning permission. Liam has uh, already said how the um, development plan will set out the standards and conditions for planning permissions and also through infrastructural public realm and community projects. And also another important action is that urban urban stormwater drainage systems for new developments should take into account the pot potential future impacts of climate change. And in that regard, you could think of some things are like including rainwater harvesting or stormwater attenuation within urban areas. In terms of climate mitigation, we currently do not within the council have a climate mitigation plan, but that doesn't mean that we've been sitting on our laurels in terms of climate mitigation uh, projects. I mentioned earlier that the Climate Action Amendment Bill 2020 will be brought to uh, government within the first 100 days of government and it is within that plan that there is a provision for climate mitigation plans to be developed by public bodies similar to the adaptation strategies within 18 months. But here in Waterford we're already um, dealing with some um, mitigation projects. One of the major ones that's ongoing at the moment is that we're currently at tender along with the Southern Regional Authorities for the retrofitting of 15,000 local, local authority public lights with LED lighting. And that will be a significant contributor to our reduction in greenhouse gases within County Waterford. We have also got a, an objective to upgrade Waterford City and County Council housing stock to BER standard of B2 by 2030. And we're also engaged in a project for the installation of high speed public EV charging points in, in various uh, population centres throughout the county. And that's in association with the Climate Action Regional Office and the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. The development standards, I suppose, looking at the development plan, one of the things we would need to consider is development standards to include EV charging points in larger developments. Any large developments that have car parking should have a provision for EV charging points. I stayed in a hotel last year which had seven EV charging points. That's three more than the publicly available EV charging points in the garden at the moment. And in looking at the development standards for charging points, we will also need to look at the sustainable transport initiatives, Warford the Metropolitan Area Transport Strategy, and a public transport strategy, uh, or sorry, look at the public transport strategy to include walking and a cycling strategy. In addition, we have engaged with a regional scheme for the creation of woodlands on public lands, and that's a project that has been run by uh, Quilja and the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Marine. If we now move on to energy and look at the natural national picture, Ireland has a legally binding target for renewable energy, as well as natural target for energy efficiency, which must be met by 2020. And those targets are set out in the National Renewable Energy Action Plan 2010 and the National 
en Energy Efficiency Action Plan 2014. And those targets are set out there as electricity is 40%, heating and cooling is 12%, transport 10%, with an overall target of renewable energy of 16% by 2020. And the figures that are in the remainder of the slide were the figures at the end of uh, 2013, which showed that the renewable energy contributed to 7.8% of the gross final energy at that time. So we were almost 50% to meeting our 2020 target at that stage. But then we need to look at how, where is this situation in relation to energy within Waterford. So this is a table taken from the Renewable Energy Strategy, which was adopted by Waterford County Council in 2016 and is part of the current development plans. So we can see there that the total energy consumption within Waterford in 2010 was 3,289 gigawatts. There was a reduction there during the recession down to 3,068 gigawatts, but it's predicted that by 2030 that will increase to 3,582 gigawatts per annum. And if we look at the breakdown there, we can see that the amount of energy being used by uh, residences is reducing, and we can see that um, transport is increasing. So we need to see how can we in increase the amount of renewable energy within that between now and 2030. And in the second table on the slide, we have the breakdown of the fuel used in the generation of that electricity. And again, we can see that there is a, a reliance on oil and electricity, and we can see that in 2030, the reliance on oil will decrease and we'll have a greater reliance on electricity, but we would hope that most of that oil it is a government, or sorry, most of electricity would be uh, renewable energy, renew or from renewable energy sources. And this is the renewable energy generated in Waterford in 2016. And we can see that um, 62.9 megawatts of electricity was generated from onshore wind. And we would hope that by 2030, that would increase to almost 132 megawatts, which is roughly a doubling but in terms of the percentage of our renewable energy, it will reduce from 21% to 17% because of the increase in energy usage. So in terms of renewable energy, how do we achieve those targets? The vision for the renewable energy strategy is to provide a strategy to maximize Waterford's renewable energy potential and its transition to becoming a more energy secure, low carbon county in line with national energy targets while balancing the need to protect the environmental, social and heritage assets of the city and county. To ensure that between now and 2030, there is a steady, progressive and measurable increase in the amount of renewable energy used electricity in the electricity, heat and transport sectors in Watford. This will help with to the achievement of the national targets. So we need to identify opportunities for various renewable energy technologies and resources appropriate to Watford. So in that regard, the development plan needs to maximise the opportunities for renewable energy development while safeguarding the environment and other amenities. And these will be subject to strategic environmental assessments and the Habitats Directive Assessment requirements. The <coughs> government produced draft wind energy guidelines in late 2019, and they have gone through the consultation period, which has ended, and we're now awaiting the final issue of those, those final wind energy guidelines. And once those are issued, the council will have to review the existing uh, renewable energy strategy, um, which is adopted in 2016. Um, recently, the CODEMA, which is the City of Dublin Energy Management Agency and the Dublin Climate Action Regional Office, prepared a position paper on decarbonising zones. And a decarbonising zone is an area identified by the local authority in which a range of climate mitigation measures can coexist to address local low carbon energy, greenhouse gas emissions and climate needs. And the range of projects developed are specific to the energy and climate characteristics of the spatial area covered by the decarbonising zone. And this can include a range of technologies and measures addressing electricity, heat, transport, building, energy efficiency and so on. A decarbonising zone can also address the wider co-benefits of air quality, improved health and biodiversity and embodied carbon and deal with agricultural practices and also sustainable land management, lower noise levels, waste, water and the circular economy. 
and should also integrate with smart data and smart cities. And it can explore the co-benefits of climate adaptation and exchange a range of measures such as climate proofing, afforestation, green and blue infrastructure and reducing heat island effects and improve citizen awareness and behavioural change. I suppose it's opportune now um, at the time that when we're drafting the Waterford City County Development Plan in that the conclusion of the position paper is that it has outlined the importance of energy planning at a local scale and the development city and county development plans provide a robust policy platform for enabling a variety of climate mitigation, adaptation and other measures to be developed. The inclusion of decarbonising zones as part of the city and county development plans can also provide for living laboratories, facilitating overlap with other cross-cutting themes of development plans, including the, including the integration of land use and transport, brownfield and infill development, employment and enterprise development, and infrastructure development and green infrastructure strategies. So this is a, was a new um, concept, certainly here in Waterford, and maybe there are some communities out there that may be of interest to them, or maybe there are some areas where we can um, include decarbonisation zones within the development plan. Just uh, one slide on the waste management plan or waste management. The Southern Region Waste Management Plan is also due for review in 2021. Um, so it's timely that it will coincide with the review of the county and city development plan. One of the issues are um, to be dealt with is the siting of waste treatment facilities. The regional waste management authorities issued um, guidance on siting of waste treatment facilities, facilities a number of years ago, but they haven't been brought into practice. And I suppose now is the opportunity that they will be incorporated either into the new regional waste management plans or the new city and county development plan. In looking at items to be considered on the new county development plan, we should look at an increase in a network of increasing the network of bring facilities or recycling facilities, and that some of these can be incorporated into newer, larger scale developments. We also need to look at some of the standards for waste management within departments and terrace developments, particularly for communal facilities. The government also published a waste action plan for a circular economy uh, earlier this year, the consultation phase is on the way and we would have to have regard to that, the outcome of that in the drafting of the development plan. The final point there relates to noise and while noise is not specifically uh, covered under waste management, I suppose it's part of the environmental enforcement which, which my department is responsible for. And many of the complaints we get will be from entertainment venues or um, commercial facilities uh, where there is excessive noise. So the new development plan should look at standards for noise for new developments for entertainment, commercial and industry, particularly those impacting on residential areas and particularly with uh, the new initiative or a new move to incentivize people living over the shop in uh, urban centres. The Water Framework Directive, while the Water Framework Directive isn't uh, within the responsibility of my department, it's dealt with by water services. I feel this is probably the opportune area to deal with it under environment for the purposes of these, this particular round of the public consultation. Um, the purpose of the Framework Directive is to protect and enhance and achieve good ecological status for all water bodies. And the current phase or the, the Water Framework Directive is being implemented in six year cycles and the second cycle is coming to an end in 2021. And it's a bit disappointing that at the end of this cycle, we're seeing a deterioration in water quality overall. While the water quality within Waterford is not as bad as some other counties, the trend nationally is that the quality of water in the environment is improving. And that is something that will have to be tackled in the next cycle of the Water Framework Directive. At the moment, work is going on the assessment of priority areas for action for the 2022 plan. And that includes catchments in Waterford, which are under consideration, include the Shore River Lower Estuary, the Dalligan and Colligan in the Dungarvan area, the Tay River, the Clona River, and the Johns River within Waterford City. And that draft list should be finalised by the end of this year and will then come into consideration as part of the development plan, because it will be important that the 
development plan provides for the preservation and improvement of water quality within those catchment areas. And it's also important that new developments cannot add pressures to water bodies. And again, it's uh, it's rather timely that we have the regional waste management plans and the third cycle of the water framework directive all being considered at the same time as the drafting of the new city and county development plan. Uh, my final slide tonight deals with open spaces, and I, I know my colleague Owen Delay will be dealing with that in more detail tomorrow night's presentation. But Lee mentioned earlier about the Southern Regional Spatial and Economic Strategy and where the development plan sits in the overall hierarchy of those plans. And something that caught my eye within that plan is the Watford Metropolitan Area Strategic Plan, and specifically Policy Objective 21, which says it's an objective to achieve a healthy green and connected city and metropolitan area through the preparation of a metropolitan wide open space recreation and green belt strategy. And specifically point C there on the right hand side, the identification of a location for a regional scale park within the Waterford metropolitan area, as well as the development of neighborhood parks and open spaces. I think the metropolitan area strategic plan and the development plan provides a once in a lifetime opportunity to provide a park of significant scale in Waterford. Yes, we have Mount Concrete on our doorstep, but this is not in the metropolitan area. And this to me is a significant provision within the regional uh, spatial strategy. So in summary, the development plan needs to address the challenges for Waterford from climate change. What policies and objectives need to be included in the development plan to make Waterford a climate resilient place to live in? How can the development plan contribute towards achieving national targets for greenhouse gas reduction and renewable energy? And can the development plan influence new developments to be self-sufficient in terms of energy and waste management? Your submissions and observations are welcome and encouraged, and they can be submitted in relation to the chapter on climate change and environment. As Lee mentioned earlier, he went through the process on the, the development plan portal at consult.waterfordcouncil.ie. Thank you. That's great. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Raymond. And if you have any questions uh, for Raymond, I see there are some coming in there already. If you would like to put them in the Q&A uh, panel and just direct them to Raymond. So thank you very much for that very interesting presentation. We will now move on to our next speaker, who is a Bernie guest. And Bernie is Heritage Officer with Council and she advises on heritage and biodiversity policy, projects, funding, and with events. So Bernie's presentation today relates to issues for consideration under natural heritage policy um, in the new development plan. So Bernie, you're very welcome. Thanks very much, Vanessa. And um, as Vanessa said, my presentation is going to look at uh, the area of natural heritage and issues for consideration in the development plan review. So as we embark on preparing a new development plan, I suppose one of the first key steps is a reflection and examination of national policy initiatives that have uh, developed since we prepared the previous city and county development plans. Um, so in the area of natural heritage, some key developments include the publication of the National Land landscape strategy in 2015. Under the Water Framework Directive, we've had the second cycle of the River Basin Management Plan. Um, as Raymond mentioned, we've had the Climate Action Plan published in 2019. We've had the third National Biodiversity Plan published in 2017 and the first All-Ireland Pollinator Plan in 2015. So essentially, these are, are framing documents, they're reference documents. These will influence um, the, the preparation of policy on a city and county development plan level. Um, so how do we translate, how do we transfer these national policy initiatives into the development plan. Well, some examples include the preparation of a landscape character assessment in fulfillment of the national landscape strategy. Um, with what we'll have due regard to the objectives in the river basin management plan when we're looking at the, the section of water quality in, in the development plan. Uh, as Raymond mentioned, we had the water for climate adaptation strategy published last September. So the objectives and policies in that strategy, I suppose, will be complemented, will be underpinned by policies within the development plan, um, looking at policies for climate resilience and advocating for measures such as natural water retention measures that can deliver um, that climate resilience. Uh, in, in the biodiversity area, I suppose there's a, an accepted growing body of evidence that there's 
there's very positive benefits for biodiversity and public health and, and well-being. Um, and in recognition of that, part of the development plan process will involve the preparation of a green infrastructure strategy. So that'll be looking at access to open space, uh, access to amenity and biodiversity, looking at the, 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 the current baseline opportunities for increasing access and where we want to be, I suppose, in 10 or 15 years down the line. And also in the area of biodiversity, I mean, looking at specific things like the development management standards, um, so currently in the development plans, we have uh, we have standards for landscaping, um, and I suppose up to up to recently it was always a it was a hierarchy or a promotion of native planting, um, native species. But you know, let's go a step further and I suppose advocate for pollinator friendly landscaping, so that there's added value in biodiversity to future developments. So I think we can all agree that Waterford has a great variety of landscapes um, that provide valuable habitats for nature and wildlife and also attractive areas for amenity and recreation. And just some examples around the Fitting County, and maybe these are places that we have visited recently. Um, so the beautiful coastline of Waterford and part of that has been uh, designated a UNESCO geopark, the Copper Coast Geopark. Uh, we have a great variety of upland habitats, so Blanket Bog and Heather Moorlands in places like the Comoros and the Knockmeal Downs that provide great Great opportunities for hiking and then beautiful river valleys along the Blackwater and the shore that provide uh, opportunities for water based leisure and um, angling. So from a nature conservation perspective in the Waterford Development Plan, these are protected as special areas of conservation, special protection areas and proposed natural heritage areas. So this is a map of what we would call the Natura 2000 network. So the SACs, which are the sites in that indigo colour. So a range of habitats uh, from the river valleys to the uplands and uh, to coastal areas. And SACs are designated for a range of habitats and species of flora and fauna. And we have nine SACs in in Waterford. Um, and then we have the special protection areas. So how they differ from SACs is that they are designated uh, solely for, for bird life. So most of the Waterford coastline is designated for the chough, which is a member of the crow family, um, distinctive by its red beak and red legs. And then we have, uh, uh, I suppose, wetland areas like Dungarvan Harbour and Chamorback Strand. And these areas attract thousands of wintering waders and, and waterfowl every year. So uh, species like the iconic brent geese that you see around Dungarvan and more. And we have six SPAs uh, in, in Waterford uh, County. So I suppose these special sites of high nature uh, conservation value that have been recognised by the EU under the EU Habitats Directive, they, they can't exist in isolation. They need to be linked um, by ecological stepping stones, if you like. So these are linked uh, by other ecological features of, of local biodiversity value. They may have not been recognised as an NHA or an SEC or SBA, but they are important in their own right. So these are habitats such as wetlands, small woodlands and hedgerows that act as ecological corridors, providing habitats for the range of biodiversity, but also very importantly, helping to clean our air and water and regulate the impacts of climate change and flooding. So a few examples, uh, wetlands, now this is a this is the series of constructed wetlands um, in the Anne Valley in Dunhill. Uh, these wetlands were constructed to deal with soiled water from sources of agriculture and, and domestic sources. Um, but by developing these constructed wetlands, we now have a fabulous amenity in the Anne Valley, all the way from Dunhill to Anstown, that is a very popular walkway and a great range of wetland habitats that, that provide home for a range of, of bird life and invertebrates. Uh, a typical panorama of the Irish countryside and um, I suppose this, this lovely uh, patchwork quilt style effect of hedgerows and tree lines. And sometimes these habitats are overlooked, but they're extremely important in their value in ecosystem services um, and you know how we manage the landscape in, in protection, protecting those tree lines and hedgerows is very important. And uh, I suppose consider the role of hedgerows and tree lines in uh, flood attenuation. This is a view of the Blackwater Valley between Valley Duff and Lismore. And if you just think for a moment, if those, if that network of, of small fields wasn't there, you didn't have, if you if you had sort of a prairie type landscape and you know an absence of hedgerows and tree lines, um, that you, the impacts of flooding I suppose could be much worse because the the hedgerows and tree lines act as sediment filters and also help to soak up that excess flood water. 
So I think it's fair to say that in 2020, we all realised the importance of connectivity. And along with connectivity to people, we also need connectivity to the natural environment. So as we consider preparation of the new development plan and you're considering making a submission, you know, think about what are the issues in your area? And um, for example, is there adequate access to quality open space and amenity in your local area? We're very fortunate in Waterford in that we have such an extensive network of trails, of walkways and cycleways, and obviously the, the, the great success story that is the Waterford Greenway that opened in 2017, and you know not only as, as, a, as a leisure asset, but also as a tourism asset. And um, I suppose you know the plan will recognise the importance of amenity areas such as those, and, and will seek to maintain and also enhance that, that, that network of trails and the infrastructure uh, required to maintain that. Um, but there's not only, I suppose, a demand for access to to walkways and cycleways, but also access to land to maybe grow your own food. So for community, making space for community allotments. And I suppose, you know, this is a great example of, I suppose, building resilience and, and local sustainability. Um, in the lockdown in the early months, I suppose, a lot of people commented on hearing abundant bird song, you know, which was great. People had time to really observe nature. Um, and I suppose what people see, hear and smell in the in the local environment, in nature and wildlife is a reflection of the, the, the habitat cover and habitat quality in the local environment. So is there a good cover of habitat such as trees, hedgerows and wildflowers? And obviously we, we can give nature a helping hand, um, such as pollinator friendly planting. Um, this example on the water greenway carried out by Waterford Council, but also looking at what you have on a site, um, on a development site, and I suppose, you know, recognising the, the value in that. So hedgerows are very important for a number of reasons, for screening, for biodiversity value, because they provide uh, nesting areas um, for a range of, of birds and mammals. And I think it's fair to say, like in past decades, hedgerows sometimes uh, got sandwiched as, as development expanded um, and maybe became dumping areas or, or litter runs and their value maybe wasn't appreciated. So I suppose the, the, the key, the key uh, recommendation is to design in your biodiversity when you're planning your scheme, because obviously it's, you know, it's fantastic to have such a resource, habitat resource, like in your development, um, you know, who doesn't like to open their bedroom window and hear birds, birds song in the morning rather than looking at a blank concrete wall with, with no um, sounds. Raymond mentioned the water framework directive and the, the need to look at uh, water quality. And again, is there good water quality water supply in your catchment and is your area free from flooding? Um, and in tandem with preparation of the development plan, there will be the strategic environmental assessment, which will run parallel to the, the preparation of policy zoning objectives and you know constantly checking what are the environmental impacts of that policy, of that proposed objective, of that proposed zoning? Is it going to have an impact on water quality? Because, you know, is there sufficient water capacity to serve that zoning uh, for that development? Is there adequate wastewater treatment? And it's, it's always interesting as well to look at the EPA water quality report and, uh, reports and, and see, you know, where the trends are at. And, I'll just take an example here of Dungarvan Harbour. So you'll see there that the inner harbour, the Colligan Estuary, uh, was rated as having moderate water quality in 2015. And then we move forward to 2018 and that has declined to poor, to poor water quality. So obviously there is some issues there in the catchment. It could be increased um, increased uh, eutrophication from additional nutrient loads or, or sediment loading. But again, the, the development plan has to be cognizant um, going forward of where we're we putting uh, various development zonings and policies and how that will impact on water quality. Um, I think this week we've all seen the news of flood, flooding stories in West Cork and I suppose a common comment has been um, I haven't been flooded before, my site is on high ground and unfortunately very few areas are immune from flood risk um, in the current space and you know we're all very aware of the, the increased intensification and, and frequency of extreme weather events, extreme storms leading to, to flash flooding. Um, so also informing the development plan is the preparation of a strategic flood risk assessment um, which looks at where the flood risk areas and then will inform policies uh, to deal with those. So biodiversity, access to open space and amenity, water quality and climate change, these are just some of the issues that Waterford City and County Council will seek to address in the next development plan. So policies uh, to address some of those issues may include, as I mentioned, the strategic flood risk assessment informing the plan. So looking at policies for making room for the river and designing in biodiversity value. So again, in the past, some water courses uh, were culverted, um, developments turned their back on them, but now we need to, I suppose, recognise the value of them um, 
suppose, to to appreciate that there, there may be flooding impacts, but to also appreciate that there is room for both the habitat feature and room for the development, and that there can be, um, I suppose, mutual benefits. So by allowing the watercourse to, to flow, by allowing the, the riparian vegetation to flourish, and there may be consideration um, for development of a walkway or cycleway within the middle zone, and then maybe the use of uh, suds to deal with a stormwater overflow from the development, so that the, the, the development is, is is benefiting, I suppose, by having such a habitat um, in in its its site. Uh, we mentioned the, the the important role of, of ecological stepping stones. So in that regard, we've been working on a habitat map of Waterford City and County over the past 10, 12 years. Um, in the current county development plan, we have identified 21 wetland sites of local biodiversity interest, and we're proposing to add another 33 wetland sites to that list in recognition of their value for both for biodiversity, climate change, and water quality, because those three key areas are all interlinked, and I suppose they, they all have uh, mutual benefits for delivering ecosystem services. Um, Raymond mentioned this about the, we're looking forward to the third river basin management plan and in that management plan it identifies uh, I suppose water, water courses that are at risk of not achieving good water quality and uh, water bodies that are not at risk. So again the development plan and the strategic environmental assessment has to have a close regard for, for those areas. Climate change adaptation and resilience um, is, is a key area for policy development. So we're a coastal county, so we need to have policies that protect against coastal erosion. And obviously, I suppose, you know, we have to be aware of policy divergence and, and conflicting policies for many of our coastal areas are obviously of high scenic amenity value, and there will be calls for development of coastal walkways. Um, but, you know, they need to be climate proofed. And I suppose we don't want to be in a situation where we're acquiring funding, spending hundreds of thousands on developing coastal walkways only for them to fall into the sea in 10 or 15 years time. So really building in that, that coastal, um, the climate change resilience and uh, climate change proofing of development plan policies and zonings. Um, so also in that area of climate change, so again, promotion of natural water retention measures, increased use of sustainable urban drainage measures and swales, um, and also uh, looking at policies on tree planting. Um, so trees are protected in the development plan. We have a number of tree tree preservation orders. Um, but again, in past decades, I suppose uh, various tree species were planted maybe in inappropriate places, so they maybe uh, grew too fast, and then there was conflict with residential amenity or utility infrastructure. So it's very important that a considered approach is taken whereby that we want to promote and increase tree planting, but that it is in the, the right tree in the right place. Uh, the green infrastructure strategy will no doubt uh, be promoting policies for increased availability of amenity and recreation space. And we've made fantastic strides in, in the past uh, 10, 12 years, whereby brownfield sites or former landfills at Kibari and Tremor, for example, are now nature parks. And, you know, we've had uh, proliferation of bee orchids in both those sites this year, which is, which is really positive um, example of, of, I suppose, of re remediation projects. Uh, and also in the green infrastructure strategy, I suppose we want to increase biodiversity enhancement and development and achieve biodiversity gain. It's not just about maintaining what's there, but really seeking opportunities for making that biodiversity better and enhancing, uh, enhancing habitat and ecological connectivity. Because this, was, this is all underlying the fact that, you know, a key goal of the plan is to increase access to our natural environment because we recognise its value as natural capital and for health and well-being benefits for our society. Um, so that's a, a quick run through, I suppose, of, of key topics in the area of natural heritage and environment. So we're inviting your submissions. What do you think are the issues for the natural environment in Waterford? And what would you like to see in the new plan to address these? So please take a look at our website, put forward your views on consult.waterfordcouncil.ie. Thank you very much. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much to Bernie uh, for that presentation. And if you have questions for Bernie, uh, please do. Um, this is your chance to put them into the Q&A and Bernie will now be responding to questions um, until the end of the session. Our next speaker is Rose Ryle. And Rose is the Architectural Conservation Officer for Water City and County Council. And tonight, her presentation, she will focus on the built heritage of Waterford, its architecture and archaeology. She'll also talk about the type of questions people have about protected structures, for example, historic buildings and features, and how as a community we can all have a part in shaping the future of our built heritage to pass on to future generations. So Rose, um, over to you. Uh, you're very welcome. 
Uh, thank you, Vanessa. Um, as, as you said there, my presentation tonight will focus on built heritage, uh, what we have, why we think it's special, should be protected, and how do we do that? What is our built heritage? Uh, it's all around us. We see it every day. Sometimes we take it for granted. Sometimes we don't even notice it. Our built heritage is, are things like planned villages. Here we have uh, an image of the model village of Port Law, which was a testimony, testimony to Quaker ideals uh, of the Malcolmsons and their cradle to grave ethos. In its day, its scale and sophistication matched those of other planned industrial towns such as Saltaire and New Lanark, New Lanark in the UK. We have Villiers Town, a planned estate village. Uh, this was a venture in the 1740s by John Villiers of Dramana House. He wanted to attract linen weavers from Lurgan to live in the area. Our industrial heritage, we have over 51 historic bridges in Waterford, uh, including the likes of Kilmac Palms Bridge. We have three lighthouses. We have lime kilns, depots, canals, mills, and the Copper Coast. The Copper Coast with its, uh, has a history of mining from prehistoric times and a uh, special character of, his 19th, of the 19th century industrial heritage is evident all along the road way there. Our country houses, our country and houses and mains, we have over 30 in Waterford, uh, buildings such as, our houses such as Capaquin, Balnatray, Glenbeg there on the lower left hand side, that building goes back to 1625, and Lismore Castle, which is probably one of the few castles that is just off a main street. We have churches and cathedrals. We have over 90 historic churches. They form the core of most, uh, they are evident in the centres of most historic towns and villages. Uh, the images I have up there, we have Christchurch Cathedral, we have Lismore Cathedral, Mount Melbury, they're all of national importance. Uh, the image in the middle is a lovely stained glass window in Clonay Power from the Harry Clark School. This is all part of our built heritage as well. It's also our tourism offering. Uh, we, we, our, our houses such as Curramore, Lismore, Capaquin, Dramana, Turin, they're all on our garden trail. Then we have small things that we pass every day and don't take any notice of. We have cast iron railings, our milestones, our stone depots, carriage arches on streets such as O'Connell Street in Dungarvan and Waterford City our flag paving, letter boxes. Our vernacular heritage is also our thatched houses. In County Waterford, we have over 150 thatched houses. Most of these are in rural areas, but we also have some urban, such as in Dunmore East and Ardmore. And nowadays the roofs are, are predominantly reed roofs. Our vernacular also, in, uh, also includes our farmyards, lime kilns, pumps, and up there on the left hand side we see a picture of a beautiful wrought iron gate that would have been made by a, a, a local forge by the blacksmith. Again, part of our history which is actually disappearing. Also part of our traditional skills is our thatching. Uh, we have about seven thatchers who work regularly in the Waterford area. Here we have Hugh, Hugh, uh, Hugh O'Neill, a master thatcher working in Dunmore East. Also on the right hand side there, uh, a joiner repairing windows, lattice windows, which were restored in Lismore Cathedral. They're about two years under the Built Heritage Investment Scheme. Each of our towns and villages has a special character defined by the built heritage of the historic core. Lismore with its castle, the shop fronts of Kappa Quinn, the thatch of Dunmore East, the quintessential Victorian seaside character of Tremor, the Dungarvan with its medieval street pattern around the castle, and also its 19th century planned layout around the square and just going on. 
the, the health benefits of the historic built environment contribute to the quality of our life. We also have follies. The magical Belly Sagat Moor Towers, Strang Kelly, and the Hindu Gothic Arch at Dramana all have a story behind them. The variety and scale of our buildings reflects the social and economic factors which influence the our towns and villages over the centuries. If you take a, a, look, a walk along the city centre in Waterford, you come across a mix of building types from vernacular to neoclassical, Georgian, Victorian, mock Tudor, Venetian Gothic, arts and crafts. And our shop fronts, our historic shop fronts in Waterford City, along the Keys, along Georgia Street, we have a great mix of historic uh, shop fronts, uh, such as J.K. Walsh's um, timber, uh, timber shop front, uh, Lynch's and Tallow, and the timber and plaster shop fronts of Kappa Quinn, and ornate detailing such as the corbel, and th these are testament to the high quality and craftsmanship. Archaeology, Waterford has over 2,700 archaeological sites and monuments dating from 4,500 BC onwards. Around the east of the county, we have the megalithic tombs and we have structures such as Ardmore Cathedral and Dunhill Tower House. We have our medieval city walls and towers. Not only have we Reginald's Tower, which is the most recognisable, but there's five other towers along the walls, which have been rest restored by Waterford Council with Department of Heritage, with, with Department and Heritage Council funding. We also have the Viking Triangle, thousand years and a thousand steps. You can uh, you can enjoy um, the replica Viking House. You can move along to Reginald's Tower. You can visit the Bishop's Palace and also the Cathedral Square. But how do we protect our built heritage? We, we protect our built heritage with legislation, development plans, grants and advice. The department, of, the department has produced a series of advice guidelines on windows, thatch, energy conservation, and Waterford Council also provide technical advice with regard to your historic building. We all have a duty and an opportunity to protect and conserve and sensitively use our historic buildings to ensure that they are passed on to future generations with their value intact. With the development plan, we do this through the Record of Protected Structures, Architectural Conservation Areas, ACAs, and our policy and objectives, uh, objectives within the plan. What is a protected structure? Protected structure is a building or structure which has an identified special interest. That might be architectural, historical, archaeological, artistic, cultural, scientific, social or technical. People often think it's an old building or a beautiful building, but that's not, all. That's not so. ACA designation means that we can protect the special character of the historic cores of the city, towns and villages and their distinctive features while encouraging suitable, sustainable and contemporary development. Our current policy provisions in the development plans aim to achieve the following, to promote protection of the architectural heritage, to foster a greater understanding of the value and significance of this finite resource, to identify, protect and enhance the unique and distinctive character of protected structures and promote sensitive reuse and alteration and to encourage sympathetic, sustainable development that will have a positive effect on the character of the structure. Conservation is the management of change and development and conservation are not mutually exclusive. Waterford Council offer exemptions from development con contributions for the restoration and refurbishment of buildings on the RPS. Since 2016, Waterford has received over 1.2 million in government funding for our architectural heritage. This in turn helps owners and communities. It helps generate employment, encourages traditional skills and enhances the streetscapes where we live. 
questions that I'm often asked with regard to historic buildings are, are they, vi vi are they viable or do they stop development? Waterford Council uses historic buildings to provide social housing in the city and the county. Here we have the Alms Houses in Tello and chair the Chairman's Arch Development in Cathedral Square. Can we repurpose historic buildings? Waterford Council has re recently uh, restored the assembly rooms and it is now the it, it is now the art gallery and WIT are based in the restored granary. Urban regeneration projects carried out by the council and schemes such as the repair and lease and living cities initiative help revitalize our historic centres and here we have a picture of Chairman's Arch before works, possibly around about 2012, and this is after the works. And this has opened up a whole new area of town. It's not just the council working on restoring buildings. Here we have the Geopark. They have restored a church in Bunman. And people often wonder, can historic buildings be successfully restored? Here we have a before and after of a thatched house and which shows it can be sens sensitively restored for modern living. And yes, you can mix good contemporary design with historic architecture. This changes our perceptions of what our built heritage actually is. Looking at how we use the square in Dungarvan and the Keys, Barnes Strand Street, Cathedral Square in the city, our historic built environment is a good place to live, work and visit. But how can we make it better for future generations? Waterford's built heritage. It's about respecting our past, but shaping our future. Please feel free to submit your ideas for the future of built heritage on our website. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rose. Um, we've now come to the end of our presentations. And we'll now we move on to our Q&A. I'm conscious that we're near the end of our meeting and um, so we will just uh, turn to the presenters and um, briefly ask some of the very interesting questions that have uh, been put in uh, during the course of the meeting. Um, we'll probably take maybe around three minutes, four minutes just to comment on some of those questions coming in and given that it is now a quarter past eight. Uh, Raymond, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll start with you. Um, some questions have come in there um, and I'm sure you've seen them and the responses have been um, uh, provided um, as, as they've come in. But this one question here on the Climate Action Bill, um, so that will be coming out as a national piece of legislation, but it will take time to come into effect. So what is the process or how will the Council include that important piece of legislation when, for example, it won't be ready at least for this phase of the consultation? So if you'd like to comment on that and then just the link between, I suppose, the work that you'll be doing at the Council and those national targets and how those are measured maybe against those national and local targets. So in respect of that. So um, Raymond, uh, if you could comment on those. Thank you. Yeah, Vanessa, Vanessa my, my, understand, my understanding is that the Climate Action Bill was ready to go to Cabinet um, during the time of the last government but unfortunately didn't make it before the change of government. Um, so I expect that that will be brought to cabinet or brought to government quite quickly and that we will see it enacted um, possibly in the next session of the Dáil. And within that then I imagine that <clears throat> we'll be expected to uh, adopt a mitigation plan quite quickly. And I've said we're already doing mitigation works and the plan will simply enable us to formalise a lot of the work that we're doing at the moment. Um, in terms of other strategies, the timelines on all of those, um, we would generally have work plans and are sorry in the measurement of um, our targets. <clears throat> we don't specifically have targets within Watford for energy renewal and those type of um, issues. All the targets are set nationally and also by sector. So our our goals will be set as part of the local government sector and we will be contributing to that. So we will be looking at um, sector wide targets as opposed to individual local authority tar targets and all of our contributions then would feed up into the national targets along with the 
other um, public sector bodies ultimately ending up with either Ireland meeting or exceeding or failing to meet those targets. And if we fail to meet those targets, particularly in relation to climate change, there will be fines imposed on Ireland in relation to that. That's great, Ray. Thank you very much for those responses. And again, just to mention that all of these responses will be published um, on the website, including the videos consult at waterfordcouncil.ie in the next couple of days. Uh, Bernie, if we could just turn to you um, um, with some questions. Just with regard to your presentation, there was a lot of very valuable, I suppose, uh, data references, such as information about flooding on biodiversity. Are, are there any sources that maybe you could recommend to to viewers and to the public that they could consult in as they are considering making a submission um, to, to this consultation. And finally, would you be able to maybe comment on the role of the development plan in terms of open spaces? So what is it in terms of the, the difference in the approach that the development plan might take to open space versus maybe operations and management? And is there a crossover at all or is there a separation there? OK, thanks, Vanessa. I'll, I'll just take the, the last question first um, on open space. So um, obviously in the current plans, uh, we have policies in open space and there's a there's a, there's a zoning type for open space. Um, but in the next iteration of the development plan, I suppose we are going one step further and that's in green infrastructure infrastructure strategy, um, bringing together, I suppose, the, the areas of open space, of access to amenity and biodiversity, um, because I suppose we're, we're very rare. We have such a rich resource of, um, I suppose, in urban of urban parks, of the wider countryside. Um, and then I suppose in recent years, we've been developing the network of, of walking trails and cycleways. So it's bringing all that together under the one umbrella. And I suppose, you know, having a, a coherent set of policies that address the various uh, requirements for those areas. Um, so I suppose we'd really welcome people's uh, input to the, the green infrastructure strategy. Um, I mean, the, the, the whole area of, of GI has been, I suppose, developing in the past 10, 12 years. And if you do a search of other local authority websites, particularly the, the Dublin local authorities, you know, they've been developing uh, GI strategies. But in it, in their original iterations, it was main, it was um, a lot of focus on habitat mapping and ecological corridors, whereas, you know, now we're, we're kind of expanding that out and, and bringing in, I suppose, the the uh, the community input and, you know, it, it's people and place. Um, it's not just about, you know, green lines and maps. It's about how people access and use those spaces. Um, in relation to source of information, yeah, there's a there's a whole range of, of information sources. Um, so I think in, in terms of um, I mean, you, you know, I mean, go online, I suppose, and look at the current city and county development plans just in, in the appendices sections that they set out uh, the, the list of NHAs, the SACs, the SPAs, also the wetlands of local biodiversity interest, uh, tree preservation orders, geological heritage sites. There's a whole range of protected areas there and people can see, oh, what's in their area? Or they may have ideas of, you know, oh, I'd like to see, um, you know, my local wetland uh, be, be recognised. Um, um, the National Parks and Wildlife Wildlife Service website, I suppose, is the go-to website for information on the SAC, the Nature 2000 network, so the SACs and SPAs. They have uh, maps, uh, they have great detailed information on the, the species uh, within those sites and, you know, various monitoring reports as well. Um, as regards a uh, water quality, uh, catchment.ie, um, the EPA, uh, the local authority uh, water programs are very good sources, um, up-to-date sources there. And then flooding, um, obviously the OPW, um, uh, the OPW websites uh, provide information on that as well. Um, so, yeah. Thanks very much uh, for that, uh, Bernie. And again, um, all the responses will be published um, on the site. Um, Rose, if I might just turn uh, to you, uh, please. Um, a question just came in, uh, an interesting question. Uh, regarding, say, buildings that are um, dilapidated or are, are in a dangerous state, is it mainly for the council or their responsibility to restore those? Or does the council have any function, I guess, in encouraging other people or society or, or buyers to get involved with, um, with the repair or maintenance or purchase of these um, buildings? And then just secondly, what are the main considerations that you would like people to think about um, in making a submission to built heritage issues within the development plan? And does maybe education and promotion um, have a role also? 
OK, education and promotion are vital because if we have to understand what we have before we can actually we have to understand and appreciate what we have before we can actually think about protecting it. Um, I think sometimes we take things for granted. As I said, like uh, the Viking Triangle, a thousand years and a thousand paces. Um, we have so much around us. Sometimes we just uh, maybe we have too much around us. Uh, we do take it for granted. Um, so yes, we 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 don't notice what we have till it's got till it's gone, uh, as the song goes. But we, you know, bit by bit, uh, our streetscapes are maybe we're, we're losing features such as say historic windows and uh, within about five years sometimes a street scape can change quite dramatically and maybe not always for the best so we we need to look at what we have and we need to say is this what we want what could we make it better could we be could we do without some things you know, I mean, if you look at a streetscape and, or a townscape and think of it without main buildings such as churches or uh, courthouses, you know, it, that would change our perception of our of how we think about our built environment, not alone our built heritage. So um, I think we just need to look at what we have, um, maybe with new eyes. And as Bernie said there during the COVID, maybe we're looking at things closer, are appreciating things better uh, now that we're, we have the time to uh, wander around our towns or villages or whatever. With regard to repair and repair and lease, um, since the COVID in particular, I'm getting an awful lot of inquiries about people uh, prob probably wanting to move to more rural areas, but they're in villages and they're wondering what grants are available how could the council help them there's a there's our lease and repair scheme which i alluded to in the presentation um that uh, that 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 there's there's also grants for protected structure uh the built heritage investment scheme um, we also give advice technical advice we also advise people with regard to um, publications that they could consult with or we uh, show them examples of maybe works that were done to buildings um, you know which were quite positive um, so with regard to buildings like that um, sometimes think people think that buildings are beyond repair but sometimes things may look worse than they actually are and with the right people with the right skills on board uh, sometimes we can re regenerate a, a house that is quite derelict and I think one of my slides showed a thatched house that looked as if it was beyond repair and now it's a very habitable structure it's a, a you know it's, it's modern and to, at the back of that particular house there's a contemporary uh, extension as well you know so we can work with what we have and, and improve on it. Um, thanks very much, Rose, uh, for that. Um, and thank you very much, everybody, for bearing with us. Uh, we're just at the end of our presentations and our, our meeting tonight. Just have one uh, question um, for um, for Liam, and that just relates to we have been discussing the the consultation and the issues paper. I suppose that's open at the moment. There is also the place standard uh, survey that is also. Uh, part of the consultation. So Liam, I was wondering if you'd just like to give um, a quick comment on that because we are we are out of time about what that is and what purpose that will be put to the responses to that. Thanks, Liam. Hi, Vanessa. My connection here is very poor at the moment. I don't know if you're hearing me. I might hand you over to Hugh on that one if that's OK. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, we can, Hugh, yes. Uh, OK, um, uh, yeah, I suppose in, in, in relation to the um, play standard, um, uh, we felt that there's an opportunity as part of the um, development plan review um, to, I suppose, to try and harness maybe people's um, perceptions or their views of uh, their own um, neighbourhoods, their own localities or places that they are familiar with um, and try and identify um, maybe uh, how those areas can be improved it's not, I suppose, it's not particularly um, part of the development plan review process itself, but it's, it's, it's. Um, I think it's a worthwhile exercise in terms of just getting, getting that information and gathering that information 
um, as part of this process because it will be important, I suppose, as we move as we move on and um, as as a local authority, um, you know, look at implementing works in terms of urban renewal and other sort of schemes. So um, I think it's important that people um, uh, maybe take a look at that. It, it won't take long to fill out. Um, it's a series of, of uh, maybe a dozen questions or so, um, uh, and it just there, there are prompts in terms of um, uh, maybe getting um, respondents or people thinking about um, their own uh, their own places. Um, so it's it's a worthwhile exercise, and I'd encourage everybody to try and engage with it. That's great. Thanks very much, Hugh, for that. And we've now come to the end of our meeting. So I'd like to thank you all very much um, for staying with us uh, until the end of this meeting. As a reminder, again, all of the questions and the videos of tonight's meeting will be published on the Development Plan website at consult.waterfordcouncil.ie. A reminder that submissions are open until the 14th of, sub of September at 5 p.m. So uh, please do everyone uh, get started on yours. And please also, if you could share widely um, about this consultation, it, the development plan does affect everybody in the county. So it's very important that everyone will get to have their say. So we hope you found this evening um, useful and helpful, and we may see you tomorrow or the next day for the upcoming uh, meetings Tomorrow is local placemaking and on Thursday it is going to be economy, education and agriculture. But thank you again for joining us and have a lovely evening. Thank you.